staring at you like it does me. <laughs> so, okay, hit it. So, welcome everyone to the Compass Points training. Um, that is what you're here to teach. Hopefully, you know that. Um, I want to start our time out together doing exactly what you will do at the beginning of each Compass Points class. So, we're just going to lead into that and I'll add some commentary on the way. Um, as people enter the classroom, which is in Ison House, and I'll show you that later, um, you'll hand them one of those glass beads, or glass gems, um, just one, because <laughs> evidently they do treacherous things with more than one. Um, if you're handing them out, I suppose maybe you're more likely to get away with that than otherwise. Um, and then over there you have couches, so everyone will gather in their couches, and then you start out by ringing the chime. Some of you have taught before, some of you haven't, so um, if you already know this, then just bear with the details. But um, So you'll start out by ringing the chime, and personally I'm a fan of asking people to close their eyes and just raise their hand when they can't hear the chime anymore. Um, you don't have to do it that way, but I think it's a nice way of helping people to get centered. So that's what we're going to do right now. way I think of transitioning from life out there to life in here. I'm going to close this door. Um, and then the next thing that you will do in your class is um, light the chalice and say your opening words. And these opening words will be hanging in your room in the Isom house. So and you get to actually have fire but in here we just have a battery operated candle. So does somebody want to turn on the candle while we read our opening words together? Sure. Any volunteers? Thank you. We light like this chalice to, to remind us of the journey we all embark upon in our lives. The journey that is the search for truth as each of us perceives it. Great. Okay. And then the next thing that you head into, and let me just make sure that I'm not missing anything, okay, is your check-in. Um, so there's a few different ways to do check-ins, and you, in your binder you'll have four on drop-offs. Um, you'll have a uh, couple pages of notes on the opening and closing rituals for the class. You can do a joys and sorrows thing, sure something happy and something sad from your week. You can do a more structured check-in question, like um, tell me your proudest moment, or what's the funniest movie you've ever seen, or something like that. Or you can just kind of do a wide open one and like share what you would like. The wide open one can sometimes be challenging to corral the kids back in if you have kids who like to go off on long tangents. Um, so I think you just have to get a feel for what your group is like and what would work best with your particular group. Um, and it doesn't have to be the same from week to week. So so let's let's have us start out with the check-in by going around, putting your little stone in the bowl, passing it to the next person, and sharing who you are, what time you're teaching, and a little bit about your history with FUS and Unitarian Universalism. I'm John Hollebeck. I'm teaching at 9 o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> it's going so fast right now. I'm glad you think so too. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll teach whatever you want. And um, <clears throat> my history with FUS, I moved back to Madison two and a half years ago and sought out the community fairly quickly. So um, before that, I had not been involved with Unitarianism that much, except they married me. So I didn't end up being a great memory. So. Um, what else? What, what, uh, yeah, that's that's good. <laughs> Thank you, John. Uh, my name is Cassie, and I'm also teaching in nine o'clock. Hey. 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 Hey.
much more interesting to me about the experience of the children. And before I was a farmer, I used to teach, so I'm looking for it was immensely. I'm Karen Jager, um, and I will be teaching at Eleven. And um, my family, we joined in um, 1989, came about the same time Michael did, and we've been active pretty much ever since. My name's Emily, I'm teaching at uh, Sundays at 9 also, and um, joined about five years ago. My husband has been in UU for life, so kind of got into it through him. Yeah. And having taught before. I have also taught some of the younger classes, and I'm looking forward to the older kids this year. And I'm Sue Denger, and I'm at teaching at 11. And, um, I have taught before on and off um, a lot of classes, but not this one. So this, I've been a member like 28 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I'm Sandy. Um, I've been here about three years, I think, before this. I was. Um, in Brookfield, in the congregation there. Um, but my grandparents were UU, so I've been exposed to it for a while longer than that. Um, and I'm teaching Saturdays. And my daughter is going to be in my class. I haven't done that for oh. six or seven years. Mm -hmm. so. I'm Emily, also. I will be teaching Sundays at 11. Um, I just moved to Madison a year ago, July, and I've been visiting FUS off and on since then. Um, I've been at UU since I was two, so my entire memory. Um, and visiting off and on since I moved here, but more on since probably January and February. I'm also very involved with the 20s, 30s group here, though it will be my first time teaching. Right. My name is Krisha Brown, and um, I'm teaching on Saturday as well. Uh, one, my child is also in class, um, and actually I've never taught his class before, but I've taught in uh, younger grades for, um, I have two other older boys, um, so we're all middle school, high schoolers in our family. Um, and we have been members since about, I think, 2005 or six. I don't remember what year, but we used to go to the Sunday group. I'm Nicole Fenske and I'm teaching Saturday at 4.30 and my son Charlie's in the class and I've taught him before, which is really hard. <laughs> You're saying I don't teach my kids, I'm like, that's smart. <laughs> but, um, I mean, he's a good guy, but when he's with his buddies, it's going to be challenging. I've taught intermittently, I don't know how long we've been members, maybe 10 years. Um, so not my first time teaching, but my first time teaching this class. Thank you. So, um, as you're going through your opening uh, routine with this class, the next thing that you do um, is share thoughts for the day. And so I'm going to randomly <coughs> pass these out. And these are just quotations that are included um, in your curriculum and each of your folders. Um, I'll show you your curriculum box later, but each folder has these on a piece of paper that you can then post around the room and invite um, students to read them. And the, the purpose that they serve is to kind of set the tone for the day's theme and to kind of, I don't know, prime the pump for thinking about some of the things that they'll be thinking about for that day. Um, and. Then there's, they're followed by some brief conversation about you know, what, what struck you about these quotations, what do they think, but it's not like a lengthy conversation, it's just to kind of get things going. So we'll probably skip the discussion part today, but I do want to ask you to share the quotations just so that you get a sense of the flavor of them. So John, if you want to have When the character of a man is not clear to you, look at his friends, check his problem. The friendship that can cease has never been real. St. Jerome, 4th century monk and Catholic saint. 
to go against the dominant thinking of your friends is perhaps the most difficult act of heroism you can perform. Theodore H. White, 20th century political journalist, author, and historian. Okay, good. Thank you. So they're, they're kind of weighty, meaty stuff. Um, could open the door on some pretty good discussion or could open the door on silence. <laughs> so who knows? Um, but one thing that I would say um, is that this engaging these kind of conversations might be really new for some of our kids. And so it's really important for you as facilitators to give them the space to kind of move into that. So let it be silent for a little while until somebody wants to come forward and say something. That's okay. Silence is okay. And maybe they'll step into it and maybe they won't. But um, it's important for you as the facilitators to give them room to do that. So, okay, so that's thoughts of the day. And then you move into the next thing, which is taking a stand. So you see at the center of this table there is a compass of sorts. Um, and every week at the start of your class, you're going to give them a statement that they need to agree with or disagree with. This is in the center of the room. North means yes, south means no. The middle means you cannot be totally ambivalent. <laughs> you can't be totally in the middle. You have to lean towards one way or the other in your answer. So you present the statement and then they take a stand on where, what they believe in relation to that statement. So um, the one from the lesson that I took those quotations from is, it's my responsibility to help my friends when they're in trouble. So they need to say, yes, I agree, or no, I disagree. Um, and that, again, really creates some good fodder for conversation. There's no right answer, there's no wrong answer, there's just, what do you think? And in, in sharing their beliefs about that, hopefully they're challenging each other, um, unintentionally or not, to think about things a little differently. So all of that is part of the start of each lesson each week, and that's what they call preparing for the journey, or sort of a journey motif to compass points, in terms of what direction are we going. Yeah, if I can, so the discussion is going to kind of take a few minutes here. We're going to have people actually yeah. talking. I'm just doing the logistics of this. Yeah, right. Well, especially for taking a stand, you really do want to have some conversation built around that. One to many or among themselves? Or? Um, well, you as the teacher saying, so John, what, what made you stand over there? What, what are you thinking about that? And, well, Karen, you stood over there. How come you decided to stand over there? And that could be a 10 minute discussion, perhaps. Yeah. Uh, yeah have you taught this before? Mm -hmm. that it's, it's really, uh, the kids just really respond well to those kind of requests. Mm -hmm. They love to be able to have a chance to say how they think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it's, I never, you know, class I taught anyway, there was no, um, no lack of conversation. Uh -huh. Yeah. Here is our one returning Compass Points teacher here today, and please add in whatever from your experience is teaching as we go along because I think that's really valuable. Yeah. Um, is there a place that you're following in terms of this in our binder that's no. walking us to? Okay. Just no. okay. <laughs> You'll see when I'm taking each, I'm going to take notes. notes. I just didn't want to do it. Anymore. You don't need to take notes on that. In fact, I do have some handouts for you that kind of summarize all this, but I purposely didn't hand them on you because I'd rather that you just listen. <laughs> so, <laughs> and then, um, you know, because I think there's a lot of different ways of absorbing information. Listening first, I think, is a good way, and then seeing it in print is another way, and then seeing it in detail in your lessons is the third way. So. Okay, so um, someone I've already kind of hinted at how this class is really different than anything that they've had before. I mean, I'd like to think that all of our classes encourage introspection and discussion, but this really takes it to a different level and brings it to a more personal level of 
what are your values and your beliefs. And I think, like developmentally speaking, this is a great time to do that. And what Karen was saying was absolutely right on. Like they really want to be able to share what they think about things. So it's a, you know, I think the right material at the right time, and it really is important stuff that I think really relates to their lives. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. That's totally and I didn't right. say this, but I'm, I'm coming here with the group of students that I talk about. Oh, yeah, so, right. So I know, I, know their, I know their tricks already. Okay. <laughs> and they're going to ask what the West and East stand for. I'd like to say who it is. <laughs> and what would you answer? <laughs> well, I would say that's what That's my answer. Yeah, so um, the West and East continuum is the continuum of maybe, and we don't stand there. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm making this up as I go. I mean, seriously, but, this, yeah. this will become a big yeah. discussion. Okay, okay. And why is it a compass and not a black and white? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, okay. Right. Just to, I just want to make sure there was an answer so I can make it for you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and you know what? If you can find a way to integrate the yeah. West and East, well, maybe well, that it depends on the question. I mean, if you think if you think of an abortion question, yeah. you know, there's a yes and no, but there's a I'm heading leaning towards not, or I'm leaning towards pro. Mm -hmm. You know. What if we could say something like, I can see circumstances where I could go either way. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a maybe, though. I don't know. You were saying no maybes, but <laughs> yeah, that's pro. Well, that's a good Western philosophy. Well. <laughs> um, nobody is going to comment, judge you harshly, or punish you if you decide that it's okay for them to stand on a west to east continuum that is a little more closer to maybe, as long as they can say why why they're there. And it's not just a, I'm going to stand here so that I don't have to think anything about it or say anything. And not that they have to say anything, because they, of course, always have the option to pass. But um, we really want to challenge them to take a stand. Did you have a question, Sam? Oh, hey, I'm glad you're raising it. OK. So let me share with you, this is a reminder, but you don't have to find it right now, the goals of the authors of the Compass Points curriculum. Um, Compass Points will lead its young adolescent participants on a year-long spiritual journey during which they will have the opportunities to sort out their feelings about themselves and their world as they do the difficult work of starting to create their adult selves, to discover what they believe about life's big questions, the nature of humanity and the divine, beliefs about death and faith, to think independently, assume responsibility, make decisions, explore values, and adopt the practice of radical hospitality. To acquire enough background in Unitarian Universalist history, polity, and theology that they can know and express what <coughs> Universalism stands for. To share the above with the adult congregation, which often knows even less about Unitarian Universalism than do children in religious education programs. And to understand that religious liberty is a hard-won legacy that continues to need protection. So, pretty lofty goals. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's safe to say that, even though that may sound like that's heavy stuff for seventh grade, that they go about it in a way that is really engaging and interactive. Would you agree? Very much so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so know that that's what they're shooting for, and don't let it scare you, because <laughs> it's not going to be that intense. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the. There's five units in the uh, curriculum that I wrote brief descriptions for up there. Um, so the the year is divided into these five units. The first unit is the journey, and that covers sessions one through five. Although I have. Number two isn't included this year. Um, but that kind of sets the tone for the year. It focuses on building your covenant and it helps them to kind of get comfortable with the role of being a seeker or asking these kinds of questions. Um, so focuses more on group cohesion and getting them comfortable with just talking about things of this nature and uh, doesn't head into anything too deep too fast. 
Um, traveling North, which is session 7 through 15, um, explores the diversity of UU beliefs and where they came from. Um, it includes one of the highlights of the year, which is the congregational poll, where they ask the congregation around in the commons area, asking people what they believe about a particular topic. We have three different polls that we do. One is on beliefs about God, one is on beliefs about what happens when you die, and one is on beliefs about the seven principles. This year's is the seven principles. We rotate them because otherwise it would get kind of boring. <laughs> People would be responding to the same questions year after year. We're hoping that if we do a three-year rotation, people will forget what they said the, a few years ago. So have any of you participated in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So that's kind of fun for them and uh, cool for them to see the range of beliefs that are represented here because it's easy to assume that everybody here thinks alike and while there are many similarities, there are definitely differences too. So, um, we've created an alternative lesson 10 on our living tradition during the Traveling North unit and there's a really good chance that not all of those lessons are scheduled because Overall, there are more lessons in this curriculum than we have weeks to schedule. Um, next, they go to Traveling East, which is sessions 16 to 19, and that focuses on issues of transition and life and death. So there's definitely some discussion about dying and death, which I think is an important thing for them to be able to talk about, and beginnings and um, life and sort of not only the birth of coming into this world, but the birth of a new self kind of thing. You know, we are evolving selves. Um, traveling South focuses on our connections to our UU faith. Um, it really focuses a lot on UU history and the struggle for religious freedom. So there's some kind of lively lessons there that focus on some of the really heroic figures from our past. And then Traveling West focuses on, okay, so how do we do Unitarian Universalism? How do we live that? What does that mean in our day-to-day -day lives? What does it mean to act in a do you way kind of thing? So a little more practical, and that session is 29 to 35. Um, and then the... What was the Traveling South? What were the, the sessions for that? Traveling South is 20 to 28. Um, I want to, uh, this is a little bit of backtrack, but I want to look more closely at the structure of, so that's the structure of the year, then there's the structure of the lessons, the first of that structure we've been introduced to, preparing for the journey, which is everything that we did at the beginning. Um, but just to give you a little sense of some of the other things that they might respond to for taking a stand so that you get a flavor of what that's like. Some of the other examples are, include statements like, our faith can guide us in our journey through life. Sacred texts, even when ancient, can still have much meaning for our lives. Change is good, and so on. And there are others, but just to give you a sense of what they're like. So, um, okay. Let's hand out the structure stuff. I know you're all <clears throat> so after the preparing for your journey part, we go into what they call the heart of the journey. And for the heart of the journey, um, you share a story or some sort of activity that either challenges their understanding of that topic or broadens their experience of that topic or in some way goes a bit deeper into the, that theme for the day. So to offer you some examples. Um, in one lesson, you're camping deep in wilderness and some animals destroyed some of your gear. Now you have to decide what to take with the one undamaged backpack that you have. And in groups, you decide what's going to come with you. But the hitch is that you all have to agree on what it is. I think probably everyone has done some variation of that activity, um, usually something about being shipwrecked or something like that. But that challenges them to think about what do, we, what do we really need in life? What's most important for us to have? There's a Bible scavenger hunt. 
Um, in one of the transitions lessons, they create a graffiti wall of death where participants write on large mural paper all the terms that they can think of um, that people use to describe death, and then they use those to explore what those terms say about us as a society, as individuals, as a culture, um, and so on. Uh, there's another lesson where they look at images of celebrities and they have some conversation about what it means to be a celebrity because of your beauty or perhaps your athletic talents versus being a celebrity because of your ideas and your values um, and your beliefs. There's another one that's a puzzle pairs discussion um, where each person is given either the name of a theological term, the word, or a definition of that term, like agnostic, pantheist, theist, and they have to find each other, and then they have to present what that is to the rest of the class. <clears throat> so that's kind of what the uh, part of the journey is like. And then from there, they go into getting there. And getting there sometimes seems very similar to the heart of the journey, but both of them are ways of really going a little bit deeper into whatever the theme for that day is. So some examples of getting there activities include creating a living timeline of biblical events, um, and then each person has to read their date and event and give a brief background on that event. Um, another one which is interesting is being wrapped in a cocoon and then breaking free of that in the transition lessons. What are the transitions lessons? Um, there's a feast in heaven and hell where their arms are taped to uh, some sort of wooden ruler or something, and hell is, they're sitting at a feast, hell is not being able to eat the food because they can't bend their arm to do it, and heaven is being able to feed each other so that everyone is being fed. So that's the biblical activity that they have left in the past. Um, there's a transcendentalist mystery dinner party. There's a tug of friendship where they all have to work together to pull on a rope and stand up together and then see what happens when one person doesn't join in on the team and how they can't do it together without having everyone. Um, so those are the kinds of getting there activities that kind of further emphasize the things of the day. And then next in the structure of the lesson is stopping to rest. And in the curriculum it says that you should be using journals, and we are not using journals because they usually end up getting left behind and um, it's just a, a sad waste of paper. So the things that they journal about could just as easily be things to just reflect on. And that could be silent reflection, or that could be anybody want to share your thoughts about this. It could be going around the circle and giving everybody a chance to respond to that. Um, but just know that you're not going to have journals. So you'll have to adapt that part of each lesson. And then at the end of each session, you take a stand again. So it's interesting to see if where they stand on that continuum is the same. It's the same prompt. So have the day's activities and discussions and whatnot changed where they would stand, or are they still pretty clear on being where they were before? Um, or sometimes instead of taking a stand, they have a quick stop um, where they have to just respond very quickly to some sort of statement. Um, like a couple of the examples are, if I were a fundamentalist, I might think, and then we would go around the circle, and people would respond. Um, or just share something that surprised you in this session or really struck you as odd or interesting or whatever. So, and, and even if it has a quick stop written into the lesson and you think it would be more interesting to do take a stand again, you can certainly do that. So that's the general structure of each lesson. Um, and it's kind of nice that it's the same each time. Mm -hmm. One thing that I didn't mention um, in the beginning that I want to bring up is um, I think it's really helpful for all of our classes to write down, have visible what is going to happen from throughout your time together. So I wrote down what we're doing together, um, preparing for the journey, it was our opening thing, we've talked about the goal structure and the substance, we're going to do a tour of the classroom, we're going to talk about drop box and supplies, 
going to talk about lessons learned from previous teachers and have question time. Um, it's good to do that in the beginning of your class, like maybe after you have then your check-in perhaps, or whatever seems right for you. Um, but I think that visual cue for them, for a lot of people just feel comforted by being able to see what's going to happen next. So um, I want to encourage you to do that in that classroom as well. So um, one of the interesting things that I want to bring up about this curriculum is, you know, it's pretty meaty stuff, and I'm sure that it will bring up a lot of ideas for you and perhaps a lot of memories from your own religious upbringing. And um, I just say this to all of our teachers now. Be mindful of whatever baggage you may have regarding your own beliefs or religious upbringing. And um, you know, we want to really present a, a diverse range of ideas in a very respectful way in our classes. And it's really easy when we get into some of these discussions to maybe talk about a particular denomination or something in a, in a way that could be crit critical of them. So if you can just kind of be mindful of that throughout the year, uh, that'd be great. but some of you are so I want you to know that there is a folder for every single lesson in your curriculum and in the folder are a variety of materials um, any handouts that you need are there waiting for you um, these are the quotations that you can post around the room and have people read um, they're also I think written on small pieces perhaps. That's something else. Um, so this includes mostly handouts for this curriculum. Um, maybe if there's a book that's needed that would be in here. Um, yeah, all kinds of stuff. So just know that your materials are in here for you. You shouldn't have to prepare any materials before coming to class. The other way that you get supplies, and, and when we look at Dropbox, I'll explain how to read our supply lists, but um, there are some items that will come to you each week in a white plastic bin that will be left probably on here, or perhaps on top of that shelf. Um, so you have those as well. This clipboard will have your attendance sheets on it, and we do ask that you take attendance because we like to keep track of people's participation. Um, I don't think we really have anyone on a waiting list for this particular class, but if we did, this is how we would determine whether or not we could let in other people based on how many people are showing up each week. Um, so, and that usually moves on top of this bookcase. The bookcase over here has a lot of the basic supplies that you will need um, each week. It's got pens and pencils, markers, scissors, glue sticks, um, matches for your chalice, your chime, um, that 
wooden bowl has, I think, rocks in it that you will pass out as people come in, like I did with the glass stone. Um, there are some journal books there. Thank you. Yeah. There are some journal books there. I'm not quite sure what those are from. I'll have to check, but they're not, they're not for your class. Um, there is this dry erase board, and there's also easel paper behind it that um, if you need to use paper, you can just clip it on there. So that's where you can write your agenda for each week. You have a recycling can and a trash can, um, fun bumper stickers, and what else? The TV here is a smart TV, so you can access the internet through it. You also have a CD player. Um, if you are using technology for that lesson, make sure you're here in enough time to make sure everything's working. If it's not working, Dan is a great go-to person to help out with that. So with Steve Gregorius, who was also there on the weekends. Um, Dan is usually a Saturday person, and usually it's both of them on Sunday. So... Uh, and because I teach the use of media and education, I will say I always have a backup plan. <laughs> yes, it's always good to have a backup plan. You mean if there's... Always. Yeah. <laughs> there's always. no username always. or password. Issue. There, just there's no on. username or password. Okay. Um, so it should it should work. I mean, another alternative if that weren't working, we could potentially roll one over here, but that is a pain in the butt. And Dan's probably over there saying, "Shh, don't tell them that." Because <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get them up the stairs. Um, so if you have a really small group, like the eleven o'clock group, yeah. you could potentially huddle around. But, um, so there is a, a restroom downstairs that you and your students can use, and then there is a conference room across the hall that if you ever needed to break out into a couple groups, you are welcome to use that as well. Um, upstairs are offices for the congregation Sri Shemaya that rent space from us, uh, as well as an office for Jerry Mosher, who is a um, lay minister, but he also sees some clients up there. And did you know that we have a radio station? No. Yes, we have a radio station, and it's at the head. When we first came in, it was straight ahead. Okay, that's over there. Um, downstairs is my body and soul. They meet down there. So sometimes they're having issues with the compass points, people being kind of loud and disruptive. So if you can just kind of remind your students if they're having fun like pounding on the floor, that there are people down there who are trying to have class. Um, anything else that I should say about your supplies? Um, I'll show you that on the, when you close the doors. We have some. Additional, oh, that one fell off. Well, a little bit of additional dry erase board here. I should probably buy some more. I'm trying to see it. It's nice to have that extra space. This is a great room. It's a little, I wish it was just a little bit wider, a little longer. Sometimes they feel a little cramped in here, especially if you have a large class. For 11 o'clock, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> so, okay. Um, here are Emergency procedures, these are also on uh, our Dropbox folders. Um, you guys have it really easy if there is an emergency. There's a door right there that you can just head out and head onto the street. Um, if, let's say, the fire was right there, then just head over there and head out that door. I don't think that you need to worry about anything, but just know that that exists. Um, you have a lot of leftover. There's scratch construction paper. There are first aid items down on the bottom shelf. Um, should anyone cut themselves or if you have the unfortunate opportunity of cleaning up bodily fluids, <laughs> there are some non-latex gloves down there and some special cleanup material. Um, what else? Kleenex is here. Oh, and name tags. Um, each of you, each class has name tags for all their students, and um, I would encourage you to use them regularly at the beginning until everyone knows each other's names. So you can just make sure that your name tags get put back in the right container. 
Each week, there's also a box with some fidget toys. If you have kids who would benefit from fidget toys, go for it. If you have kids who think fidget toys are something to throw across the room, nah. <laughs> so, some kids do really great with them, and some really don't. So, uh, you'll just have to see how that goes. So, we also have a whole bunch of leftover not leftover, but a whole bunch of poster board in here. And I think that's just because Rachel doesn't know what's hiding back here. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell her. There's plenty of poster board this year. Any questions about this space? The window blinds are top of the line because we have connections. So you can put it up like that. You can, maybe some of you are familiar with these from home. Can pull this down and have a little diffused light in here. You can have it totally up. Pretty nice, especially this is important um, for the 430 people because the sun can bake you in here. So feel free to open the windows. Please remember to close them when you leave because no one really monitors that all that closely and sometimes they get left open for perhaps days. <laughs> so please remember to close them. Okay? All right. Let's head back. So how many of you um, are familiar with Dropbox? Quite a few. Okay. Um, if there's anyone who is not comfortable with Dropbox and doesn't want to access their information this way, please let Rachel know and she'll be happy to get you materials in paper form. Um, but if not uh, that, then just know that like there's a ton of information here. And there's a lot that you you know can just look at electronically, and you don't. It's not like you have to write in it or anything. So there may be some things that you you're fine with on Dropbox and other things that you're not. So this is where your class lists are. And did you all get the link that Rachel sent out? Okay. So you have your class lists. And um, you know, there's a, a list for each time. I'm just going to kind of walk through some of this stuff. So you have the name of your students, you have their parent contact, email, or their parent, parent names, and then you have the email contact information for both the primary parent and an additional one. Um, because we ask you to send out emails each week giving a summary of the class, it's important that you have these email addresses. And it's also important that um, unless you know that no new kid has added the class, um, that you go back to this. Like, we have some classes where there are kids adding throughout the year, and it was becoming kind of a nightmare for us to keep current information in teachers' hands so that they had everyone's email addresses. So this is a great way to do that, because Rachel and I can go on there and add an email address, and then the next time you go to send an email, you go here, you copy and paste the email addresses, and send out your email. So that is going to be like way, way easier this year. Theoretically, you should. Okay, so I have to open it. Open it. This is what, the thing I I'm learning Dropbox. Okay, so I earlier this week I'm like Rachel, I can't. Can you just highlight one column? I don't know what the problem is. And she said, did you open it? And I said, no. Oh, that's right. You have to actually open the folder. So once that's opened, then you can just highlight that column, copy and paste it into your email. Okay? Very, very nice feature, we think. Um, and then you have your the phone numbers and uh, and all of your contact information for the teachers. At the bottom of the class list are, is all the teacher contact information. So your names and emails are right there. So Rachel and you are the only ones that can make changes on it? We are the only ones who can make changes. However, you guys can make uh, comments. So let's say you want us to change your email address, you can just go to review, I believe, uh, new comment, and I can say, please change my 
human address. And then theoretically, and then post that. And I believe Rachel and I get a little notification saying that a comment has been added by Karen, and then we know to go there and take a look at what she said. This you can use um, any Dropbox file. So if you're doing a lesson, for instance, because all the lessons are also available on Dropbox, and you have some feedback for us on that lesson, then you can go ahead and leave us a comment on Dropbox. I'm confused. What's in here compared to what's in there? So what you have there is a paper copy of the curriculum. You don't have class lists. You don't have supply lists. You don't have your calendar. You just have a paper copy of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Right. Was that? Oops. I didn't need to do that. Shoot. Sorry. I got a line. Sign it. Um, I do actually have paper copies of your calendars for tonight, or you pick them up, I believe, uh, because I want you to have an opportunity to start putting your schedule together tonight. Uh, but they're also available. They're also available on Dropbox. Are we able to add them in calendars? Um, I don't think so because then everyone would have that, you know, like. Yeah, so we, we used we used Gmail, we used Google Docs Google last time. We did a lot of our rescheduling. That's great. If, if someone from each team wants to set that up, that I know a lot of teaching teams can do that. This is essentially Google Docs. It seems like. Great. So going down the line of other materials under Compass Points, um, there's. These images of Garden of Eden and Sages are from one of your lessons. We're not, we don't need to look at that right now. Um, they're really there more for us than there for you. But then you have lessons. And so all of your lessons are included here. We um, have the offers to send us electronic copies of lessons this year, which is really, really nice. So that's the same as what's in here. Holding. Yep. Okay. And, um, there's a couple lessons that we have, like I told you, we wrote lessons one and two. So you don't even, well, you have the old ones, but I'm here, you don't even have the old lessons one and two, so there's no room for confusion. Um, you only have the new lessons one and two. Um, there's a couple lessons that I have written suggested um, edits to, you know, different activities and whatnot. This is very interesting. So you're saying like lessons one and two and not? They're up there. The, my revised ones are up there. They're on there. Um, the ones that they wrote are not up there. So I guess it looks like you have to download your lessons. That's interesting. Well, there we go. Okay. So that's exactly what it looks like in your paper copy. You know, this is just a, an electronic image of what your paper copy is, right? Um, so, sorry, this is just to, I don't know why it's being you know, so jumpy, except that this is a really old computer, and probably not the quickest, not the sharpest tool in the shed. So, anyway, um, under your lessons folder, you have all of the lessons that you need. Um, session 16, for, in, for example, I wrote suggested edits to that lesson. Those are there. Somewhere. Materials associated with a particular session. 
Um, this has my suggested edits for session 16, and then there's another folder there that has the guided meditation that's a part of these suggested edits. So, uh, okay, so there's your lessons. Then you have your Compass Points calendar. who are new to teaching, um, there are two dates, I believe, in your calendar here that it says faith and action activity. Every class has a faith and action coordinator, and the role of that person is to plan two service projects during the year. So that is their thing to, to lead and take responsibility for. Um, they're supposed to keep you in the loop about what it is that they're planning, and we ask that one teacher be present for whatever that is. Lots of times it is not here, it's off-site, especially since these kids are older and it's easier to take them off-site. Um, so we do ask that one teacher be present for that. So there are those lessons, like for instance, your first one is at the bottom of this page, which is October 8th. Or ninth, and the faith and action activity could take place any time during that weekend. It's probably not going to fit neatly into the time that your class usually needs because they're coordinating with some other organization to do something. It could be cooking a meal at the homeless shelter, or doing some sort of cleanup at the arboretum, or any number of things. Um, so that's there. I've put in the calendar the children's chapel dates. Your kids don't go to children's chapel; they're too old for that. Um, if you don't already know this Children's Chapel, is something that happens um, at the beginning of worship time, and it lasts about 20 minutes. It's a time when, you know, normally our kids start out in the auditorium with everybody else, but on Children's Chapel days, they meet separately from all of the adults. And they're there for about 20 minutes, and then they go to class. I put that there not because your kids have participated in it, but because some of, the, some of you have younger kids, and you might want to be with them in Children's Chapel have to be, but I just wanted you to have that information. I also noted that on the first day of class, it's really great if all the teachers can be there so that all the kids can meet you and you can meet all of the kids. Attendance is usually quite high that first day, so it's a good opportunity to capture everybody. And um, I also think it's a good idea to have whatever teachers are present take a piece of leaving class that day so that the kids are identifying you in that role. Um, so hopefully when you have some plan, some time to plan for the next couple months, you can figure out who's going to do what for that. And anything else that I want to point out about lessons? You know, um, as Sandy mentioned, it, these are scheduled for Saturday and Sunday. So you know, just kind of be careful as you're doing your calendars to know which days are yours. There's some. I warned you when daylight savings is coming. Um, there are some lessons, like for instance in December, like the weekend of December 3, 4, there's no Sunday classes, so really that information is there for the Saturday people. And then two weeks later, there's no Saturday class because it's the winter solstice service and everyone goes to the winter solstice service. That is why the same lessons are scheduled twice because it's different groups doing that. So just, you know, kind of be on the lookout for that. In January, we reconvene by creating your class banner. That's something that all of the classes do each year. It's a great way to kind of reconnect after the holidays. They will not have seen each other for quite a while. Um, so it's a nice way to kind of have some social time. And the banners are supposed to highlight something about your class, so it also gets them thinking symbolically about what you've been studying, like how are they going to represent some of the themes of compass points. Um, so it gets them a little reconnected with the content while also giving them some time to socialize and catch up with each other. And then we have a banner parade a few weeks later when all of our classes have had a chance to create their banner. We'll start, um, start out service with a banner parade and you'll be given lots of information about that too. So any questions about the calendar? Can you 
explain the difference between the curriculum lead and the community? Thank you. Yes, absolutely. The curriculum lead is the person who is responsible for the bulk of the lesson, you know, for really delivering the main content of the lesson. The community lead leads the opening and the closing rituals and is the person who uh, kind of pays attention to how kids are acting in class. Uh, that can be good or, you know, paying attention to good things and to some of the more challenging things. So if there are behavioral challenges in the class, the community person steps in and deals with those things so that the curriculum they can just focus on the lesson. Um, if the kids are doing some team activity, and let's say they're being like really respectful of each other, really cooperative, really inclusive, whatever, the community lead can shine a light on that and you know, be sure to give positive reinforcement for that kind of thing. So that's the difference between the two. Um, I highly encourage people to take turns being one or the other and not just do the same thing each time. And it doesn't mean that you can't, you know, like if you're curriculum lead that you can't intervene in some sort of behaviors or something like that, or if you're community lead that you can't comment on the content of what's being talked about. It's not that rigid. It's just, you know, mostly I'll do this and mostly you'll do that kind of thing. So thank you for asking that. I feel like I need to talk about that. So that is the calendar. All right. While this is coming up, okay, um, so as you are preparing for your lesson, I highly suggest that you be through it like a week ahead of time so that you're familiar with the content that you can be thinking about it, how you want to present it um, as much as possible. It's great if you can not read from your binder um, so that it's more authentic, I guess. Um, and so if you read through the material ahead of time, then you have some time to kind of make it yours and think about how do I want to convey this in a language that feels right and comfortable for me. You don't have to go word for word with what's in the binder. You really want to kind of deliver it in a way that feels right for you and it's, you know, indicative of your way of communicating things. Um, so as you're approaching this, I would say read through your lesson at least a week ahead of time and then check your supply list to see exactly what materials you're going to have. So you know that you have your basic supplies that are in there all the time, but then uh, there, so it's listed for each lesson what you're going to have. Let's look at lesson three, for instance. The stuff that's in the, in the uh, grid there, the copy paper and the lunch bags, those are things that will come to you in this, okay? Anything that's in that grid is going to come like that. And then believe that is the stuff that you will find in your curriculum box folder. So in that way, you always know what kind of materials you're having. There might be some little notes to you as the teacher of things that you need to prepare, like for lesson four, teacher prep, invite the students to bring a smooth stone that week. You don't need to do that. Um, there's not a ton of teacher prep for this curriculum, uh, unlike some of our like more crafty classes. But there may be some things like for lesson six, contact your classroom support coordinator to ask the parent to ask a parent to bring lemons that week. So classroom support coordinators, for some of you you may not be familiar with those, each class has a classroom support coordinator. Um, in the younger grades, that person schedules uh, a parent helper each week. In seventh grade, they don't really need parent helpers. Um, so they don't do that, but if there's ever something unique like this need for lemons, um, then there's a little prep flag to you that you should let your classroom support coordinator know that someone needs to bring lemons. Um, so, and then the other thing that we ask them to do at this grade level is to plan a couple social activities for your class. And that's not something that you as teachers have to be a part of. That's a response to middle school kids saying that they really wish they had more social opportunity for um, their classes outside of class time. So that's that roller that's skating thing. The, uh, the roller skating thing, yeah. <laughs> that, that's sort of like that on a big scale because okay. that's uh, all of middle schoolers are um, invited. Okay. And then the classroom support coordinators just do your class. You will notice that 
you get any email that I send out to the parents of the kids in your class because that's the way our database does things, for better and for worse. We are going to be phasing into a new database, and that is a glorious thing because we, there's lots of limitations to our database. But um, for now, you'll be getting all of those emails. Um, and it's kind of nice to know what's going yeah. on in the broader community. You, you, so. you nicely put it as parents. Yes, yes. So, um, any questions about your supply list? Um, just to, yeah. yeah. So we just have to get in the habit of looking ahead because often it's it's listed on lesson four. We should we might need to be mentioning that on lesson three, right? Yes. And putting it out in the email to the parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because every week you send out an email summarizing what happened, and that's the opportunity to say, hey, tell your your kids to bring along this new rock next week if they want. Yeah. Um, this is a calendar that is for the parents, and the reason why you have that in there is that I'm going to ask you before classes begin to send a welcome email to the parents saying we're really excited to be seeing your kids soon in Compass Points. Here's a little glimpse of what we're going to be doing this year. Um, the teachers are blah, 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 blah. If you wanted to, you could include pictures of yourselves. Um, and then you can attach the calendar for the parents. And what's different about it is it doesn't have curriculum in the community. So that gives them an idea of what you're going to be talking about each week, which is kind of nice for them to have. So that is there for you to use when you send out your welcome letter. And one of your next steps is to decide who's going to do that. Um, then there are, we're going to go over these briefly tonight, but um, we compiled some reflections from previous teachers about Compass Points. And then there's a lot of them that just, I think I have a little part of it, but they're also there. And then all of your session quotes for those um, thoughts for the day are available here as well. I'm not going to wait for it, this is too small. But you know, now you know that they're there. So that is everything that's in the Compass Points folder. The other folder that you were sent a link to is the teacher materials. And I just want to show you kind of quickly what's in there. <clears throat> One thing is the Suggestions for behavior management, if that's helpful to you. Um, I will also add that I am always available to deal with behavior issues. If there's some chronic issue in your class, please let me know sooner rather than later so that we can address it. Um, when I'm here, I wear a pager. So if there are any issues that need to be dealt with, like let's say something is going on and you just like need that kid out of the classroom for a while to decompress then you can come to the child care room, which is right across the hall, and they will page me, and then I can sit and talk with that child and just uh, decompress for a little bit. He or she can have a break from class, they can have a break from that student, and then we can kind of take it from there. Um, sometimes we have had to have meetings with parents and teachers to kind of work through a plan for how to address some behavioral things, but more often than not, there aren't any issues. Um, but I do want you to know that you don't have to suffer in silence all year if there's some, something going on. Um, for weekends when I'm not here, um, there will always be somebody who is carrying around the pager, and I'll let you know who that is through Teachers News, which is an email that I send out almost every week with whatever information I think is important for you to have for that week. So, there's that. Um, there's information on classroom rituals. So this is at the front of your binder, but also the whole chalice lady 
writing thing. Um, it's kind of yours is kind of more written into it, so I don't know that it's going to be as relevant for you. But if you're feeling fuzzy about classroom tools, know that that's there. Okay, that's probably what we really have to say about that because I think it's really clearly laid out in your curriculum. Um, uh, ideas for community building in your classroom if you feel like you would benefit if your class just doesn't feel very cohesive and you would benefit from having more community building time. There's a bunch of ideas there. There are forms that I don't think will be relevant to you. Um, there's other resources that might be like on faith development or um, develop, you know, behavior development, milestones, kinds of things that are under the other resources folder that are there for you to access. There's teacher tips. Um, this classroom volunteers list is the grid that you have that lists all the teachers, the CSCs, and the faith and action people. So it's the same thing as what you have there. Um, if you wanted information on how to build a covenant for your class, which happens in lesson three for you guys, there's some guidelines for that there. You don't teach in the nursery school, so that's a good point. Um, if there are any allergies in your class, let's take a look. Uh, you don't have snack that's worked into your class, but I know that people show up with food, which is totally fine, but it's important that you be aware of any allergies in your class. So let's just kind of take a look and see if we have any. The way that this is laid out. Um, it's done by class, and there are none compass points. So you don't have to worry about that. I'm to figure out how to get out of here. This is so weird because it seems like every page I pulled up is a little bit different. Um, there's information on supplies that I went over, but if you're a little fuzzy about how you're supposed to be getting supplies, you can look through the user's guide. There are teacher orientation videos from previous teacher orientations that you can take a look at. And then there's a teacher's manual, and that lays out some of our policies and procedures and kind of like a suggested way of occurring for each week. Um, probably the most important policy that you are aware of is that we have a two adult rule and um, you have to be sure that you always have two adults in the room with the kids. So if for instance there's a week when one of your co-teachers doesn't show up, then for you guys you can probably send a kid over to find a parent or me or Rachel um, so that we can make sure you have a second adult there with you. So if you've never taught here before, it wouldn't be a bad idea to take a look at that teacher manual and just see what's in there. So, okay. Any questions on that? All right, I do want to hand out your poll for this year because they are different each year, so I um, want to make sure that you have the one that you need for this year. And... All right, so let me see if there's just a couple more things that I want to add before giving you time to get together with your team. Um, the 430 section does not have a faith and action coordinator. I, you may have noticed I've put out a call for one a couple of times. Um, if we don't have one step forward, then just don't have class ID. Unless you want to find something else, but I don't think it's really fair for you guys to have to find something else if no one else is willing to step in to be a faith and action coordinator. I'm really surprised by it, but um, that's, I think these guys are old enough that they can go to service that day. Okay. If you guys aren't hearing anything from your faith and action coordinator and the time is getting near, let me know. I mean, I, I send out reminders to faith and action coordinators and give them a little nudge, um, but sometimes, I'll get I'll get an email from teacher saying, you know, we've heard nothing and it's next week. And I have no idea what's going on. So that's important information for me to have. The compass points kids all start out in service at the beginning for the message for all ages.
pages. These lessons are designed for 60 minutes. Um, there have been teachers who have inclined, inclined to have kids just come directly to class. I would not recommend that unless you want to come up with about a half hour's worth of content. <laughs> so have them go to service. It's good for them to experience service. In two years, they're going to be doing their own service. So they should be going to service at the beginning and then coming to you after the message for all ages. And uh, when you... Except, do, except on Children's Chapel Day? Children's Chapel Day, they should come direct or something? No, they st they'll still start out with the big, oh, okay. the big kids. Uh -huh. I see, the big kids yeah. always goes, and then the Children's Chapel splits off. Right. Right. So a couple other handouts that I want you to have are... <coughs> Did everyone get a copy of the middle grade students mm -hmm. and the reflections from the previous teachers? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the middle grade students, um, we're not going to go through that, but if, you're, if you have any concerns about teaching this age group or curiosity about what they're like, then I would encourage you to read through that. This is from um, a middle school principal who shared these thoughts with us. And then the reflections from previous teachers, I think, is kind of useful. So some of what they had to share was just how, um, how different this class is for these kids because it is asking them to engage in material, uh, with material in a way that they haven't been asked to before. So to be kind of patient with that and um, to provide some of the structure to allow them to step into that space. So. Um, this person said, guide them in how they should participate, or they will default into participating in ways that you like you won't want, or you know, more silly-ish kind of stuff. So if you kind of set the tone that this is a fun but more serious opportunity to be together, um, then that will go a long ways. Uh, this person suggested don't let them spread out too far physically, keep them closer in to prevent them from hiding. A distance away, avoid the fidget toys, start out with more structure about sharing, like raising hands. Um, if you, if that becomes an issue in your class, we can, we have some talking sticks that you could use um, to help them not talk all over each other. Um, the covenant should always be posted in your classroom so that you can refer to that as a way of reminding them how to be respectful with each other. Um, and then it's always easier to loosen up as you go along, but to start out with some pretty firm guidelines about how they should be in community together. Um, one teacher would always start out class with a minute of silent reflection. You could do that if you want. You know, you could ring the chime and then just have that silence continue for about a minute before heading into class. She found that really helpful. And. I think the rest you can probably read through on your own, but there were some good observations from previous teachers. So, um, one person talked about the covenant that you build and you know, really utilizing that to help manage classroom behaviors. So, okay. Any questions? All right, then what I want to do is give you time with your teaching team to start working on your calendar. And you might also want to use that as a time to communicate with each other, maybe what you really need from each other to work well together as a team. Um, so for instance, if you have a kid in the class, you might want to give some guidance on how others should interact with your kid, because sometimes people are really hesitant to intervene with another person's child when, they're, when the parent is in the room. Um, if you're someone who really, like, rarely communicates by email, then you need to let your team know that so that they're not always waiting for you to respond by email. If you're someone like me who really values quick email responses, um, that's a good thing to let people know. Um, so think about that a little bit too with your teaching team and how to best work together because uh, probably more frequently than complaints about the kids are complaints about teaching team members and, and how they're not 
communicating well or working well together. Honestly, that can be a big issue. And I think there's a lot to be gained by investing some time to building that team in the beginning, kind of like we do with our kids in the community building. Um, I think it's important for the teams to be able to really be on board with each other. You kind of have each other's backs throughout the year. And um, it's good to know that you can trust them and um, communicate well with them. Um, speaking of teams, if, for instance, you are not able to make it one let's say you're scheduled to teach and you're sick that day, um, what you would want to do is contact your team members and see if anyone can fill in for you. And if they can't, then contact your classroom support coordinator and see if that person can fill in. And lots of times, or get a parent to fill in. Um, it doesn't happen very often that there's no one from the team who can help out. But if that did, um, then the teacher, teacher, the person who's used to teaching this curriculum would have to step in as the curriculum lead. And whoever is helping out as an outsider would just be there as the second adult. So, okay, so why don't you break up into your teams and spend a little time on your calendar. And